So what we're going to talk about today, chapter 7, which is all about angular motion. This chapter isn't going to be too bad, because we've already discussed motion in general, now we just need to extend it to angular motion. And in particular, we're going to be looking at motion in circles. After all, a circle is just one big gigantic angle that's equal to 360 degrees, right? Right. So we already know some quantities to study how things move, how things uh, undergo motion. We have three kinematic equations of motion, and they depend on three variables, delta x, displacement, v is velocity, a is acceleration. And we can draw analogies, analogous uh, quantities for angular motion. In terms of displacement, we have a delta theta, an angular displacement. In terms of velocity, we have an omega, an angular velocity. And in terms of alpha or a, we have alpha, an angular acceleration. So they're the same exact things that we have in linear motion. They're just now moving at angles. And to describe those, um, those angles, uh, these, these motions, we, we need some units. <coughs> so, in, uh, in, in displacement, the typical units that we use for displacement are going to be equal to meters. Typical units for velocity are going to be meters per second. Typical units for acceleration are going to be meters per second squared. In angular motion, we need a new unit for describing distance. We don't want to use meters. We can't easily measure a meter over an angular uh, displacement. So we use a new unit called a radian, which means we'll have new units of angular velocity going to be radians per second. and we'll have new units of acceleration which are going to be radians per second squared. So how can we talk about this first quantity? This first quantity that everything's going to be probably be based on, uh, based on our experience with uh, linear motion, how do we describe angular displacement? So to do this a circle. So let's draw a circle. First we'll draw a y-axis, we'll draw an x-axis, and we'll draw a wonderful little circle. Here's my circle. I'm going to draw a certain special line. It goes from the center of our circle out to the outer edge. If you remember what this line is called, we're going to label it an R, so that's the radius. And then I'm going to travel along the outer edge of this circle a certain distance. I have no idea what that distance is. It's some distance, whatever it is. And we can see this would be very hard to measure with, with the straight ruler because I'm arcing. I don't have a, a direct path that I'm traveling. I'm traveling along this, this arc. I'm going to call this the letter S, and that is going to be the arc length the length I travel along the arc of my circle. And then I have, again, my distance from the center of my circle out to the uh, end of my arc length. So that's also going to be a radius. So what I've done here is I'm at some final theta, some final angle, and I started at some initial angle relative to this x-axis. So this distance that I've traveled in terms of an angle, is an angular distance. That is my definition of theta. So I can take this a step farther. My delta theta is my angular displacement. So my omega, by drawing analogy to what we know about velocity, where velocity, we'll just do a little reminder down here, velocity is change in x over change in t. So all I'm going to do here is replace my change in x with my angular change in position, which for, uh, as we see above, is delta theta, the angular displacement over the change in time. Since this is a vector quantity, vec uh, velocity is a vector, 
angular uh, velocity is also going to be a vector. So we need to know the sine. The sine comes from the, di uh, the, 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 the direction comes from the sine. So a positive sine or a negative sine will tell us direction. Positive or negative. And it turns out we determine these directions by what direction you're traveling around your circle. If you are traveling counterclockwise, so that's going to be traveling against the direction that you think the clock should go. If I'm going counterclockwise, then I'm going to be positive. If I'm going uh, clockwise, then I'm going to have a negative angular velocity. So if I'm going the direction the clock turns, I have negative. If I'm going counterclockwise, then I have a positive angular velocity. <coughs> and we can do another analogy to get our final quantity of interest, uh, our angular acceleration. If we remember regular acceleration is uh, velocity over time, so angular acceleration is just going to be a change in angular velocity over change in time. So now we have three quantities, three equations that we can work with. Alpha, omega, and change in theta. Describing displacement, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. So if I have all these quantities now, I can turn them into kinematic equations of motion. So if you remember, we have three kinematic equations of motion. V final is equal to velocity initial plus a times change in time. We have change in x is equal to initial velocity times change in time plus one half a times change in t squared. And we have v final squared is equal to v initial squared plus two times a times change in x. And I can do angular uh, analogies to all of these to get my angular equations of motion for kinematics. I have omega f is equal to omega i plus alpha times change in time, where all I'm doing here is replacing each of the angular quantities, uh, linear quantities, with their angular quantities. So a turns into alpha, vi turns into omega i, Vf turns into omega f. I do the same thing with the second equation. In ch instead of change in x, I have change in theta is equal to, instead of Vi, I have omega i. Time doesn't change if I'm moving in a line or in a circle. And then plus my one half, instead of a, I'm going to have alpha times change in t squared. And then finally, I replace my Vf with omega f squared is equal to Vi squared, change to omega i squared plus 2. Instead of a, I'm going to have alpha. And instead of delta x, I'm going to have delta theta. So now I have three kinematic equations of motion that I can use for things moving in angular uh, directions, for things moving in circles. Now if I want to do comparisons between linear and angular motion, I can do that, but there's not a direct one-to-one -one correspondence to things. What does that mean? It means that my velocity tangent, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means in a second, this is going to be a linear quantity, a linear velocity, is going to be equal to a radius times an angular velocity. So the linear motion of something changes depending on where I am, depending on my radius. <coughs> so we can see this in terms of a bike, a bike tire, and we'll do a demonstration of this in class where we see that on a bike tire, further points on a bike tire
have to move faster. Linearly. So to understand this, we need to look at a circle. We look, need to look at what linear velocity is. So this tangent velocity that I talk about, tangent velocity, that's referring to, let me come to my circle and draw a line that just touches that circle at one point. That little line right there is my tangent velocity. So I'm looking for the velocity at this one little point right at that position of the circle. And I can find the tangent velocity anywhere. I can find the tangent velocity at this point of the circle. So I want to find the tangent velocity there. I am finding the velocity if I drew a line right that attaches to the circle at only that one point. That is my tangent velocity. And that tangent velocity is going to be equal to whatever my angular velocity is at that point times whatever radius I'm at. <coughs> and this is going to apply not only to tangent velocity, it's going to apply to tangent acceleration. A tangent is going to be equal to radius times angular acceleration. Okay, this is kind of hard to see on a video, much easier to describe in person. And there are some consequences of these kinds of uh, tangent motions, the acceleration tangent and the velocity tangent. So one of the consequences, one of the big things that we need to realize is that omega and alpha are constant on a circle. And again, we'll need to do a demonstration. We'll need to actually look at this to understand this better. Uh, just covering that right here for the moment. <coughs> so let's look a little bit more motion. Let's take my circle. Let's draw a better circle than that. That's a piece of crap circle. Let's draw my circle. Let's talk about velocities on this circle. I'm going to take a tangent velocity, so here's my little point, and I'm going to draw a line that attaches to my circle at only that point, so I have some velocity, we'll call it v1. I'm going to have a different velocity, v2. Okay, v1 is equal to r times omega, times the angular velocity at that point. v2 is equal to r times omega again. Now if this is a circle, same radius throughout the circle. This r is the same as this r. And as I just discussed, the angular velocity at all points on a circle are equal. So omega here is equal to omega here. They're the same thing. So these velocities, I have a question for you, is v1 equal to v2? Remember, velocity is a vector, has direction. So if I look at the directions, velocity 1 is going kind of to kind of to the right. Velocity 2 is kind of going down and to the left. So they have different directions, so v1 is not equal to v2. They have different directions. So that means velocity is changing. v is changing. If velocity is changing, even if it's not the magnitude, the magnitude is staying the same. The magnitude is not changing. The direction is changing. The velocity is changing because direction is changing. And because of this change in direction, that means I have an acceleration. <coughs> so when velocity changes in a circle, and the velocity changes just by virtue of moving in a circle because the direction constantly changes. V changes in circle. That means that I have acceleration in a circle. And 
since I have acceleration, we call that a special name, acceleration in a circle. In a circle is going to be something we call centripetal acceleration. You might have heard of the term centrifuge. That's where it comes from, centripetal acceleration. <coughs> Excuse me. We have an equation that we use for centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration AC is equal to V squared over R. And it works for circular motion. It works when you're going at a constant speed. So the magnitude of the velocity, otherwise known as speed, doesn't change, but the direction changes. And this uh, uh, centripetal acceleration always points in a specific direction. Since it's an acceleration, it needs a direction. It points towards the center of a circle. Okay, and we can uh, write this a slightly different way. If I write my uh, v in terms of my uh, angular quantities, remember v is equal to r omega. So I can write this by replacing v with r omega over r. So I've just substituted in for my v. And then if I square these values, I get r squared omega squared divided by r. One of my r's cancel. And I also get that ac is r omega squared. So I have two different equations I can use. I can use ac is equal to v squared over r if I'm given linear quantities. Or I can give ac is equal to r omega squared if I want to work with angular quantities. Either one will work. So, we need to go back, revisit this vector nature of our angular velocity omega and angular acceleration alpha. How do I actually find the direction? This is, again, going to be something that's very difficult for you to see, for you to understand from watching a video. We'll need to actually do some demonstrations in class. But the method to find the direction is to use something called the right-hand rule. Right-hand rule. We can use positive and negative signs, but we're not always given that. So we need to use this right-hand rule. In the right-hand rule, you use your right hand in doing this. You curl fingers in the same direction that you're rotating. Curl fingers in direction of rotation. And your thumb is going to point towards omega. And if omega is increasing, then alpha is in the same direction. If omega is decreasing, then alpha is in the opposite direction. Again, we're getting this down so you have it to study with. We're going to need to do some visual uh, examples so that you can actually see how this works. Continuing onward, 
we have centripetal acceleration. AC is equal to m times v squared over r. So anything that's moving in a circle experiences this acceleration, AC. If I take a mass and I multiply it by this centripetal acceleration, then I get a force. I get a centripetal force. So any force that's moving in a circle, force in a circle, is a centripetal force. It's centripetal in nature. Okay, so the centripetal force isn't any kind of special force. In nature, we'll put that in quotation marks. So the type of force that you're having when you're moving in a circle is a centripetal force. <coughs> it's not some special force. It's not a specific force like gravity. It's not like a normal force. It's just uh, a way to describe your force. It's a um, description of a force. It's not an actual force that's acting. Some other force supplies the centripetal force. It's a description of force in a circle. Okay, so this equation that we get, Fc, centripetal force, is going to be equal to m times ac, is going to be equal to m times v squared divided by r. What direction is it going to act? The direction of our force is going to be towards the center of circle, because that's the direction of our centripetal acceleration. So we'll have an example that we'll do of this. We'll discuss the example of the water bucket. Again, yeah, this is going to be a visual uh, example that we'll see. Perhaps we can make a video of this water bucket and stick it into this lecture so that you can, you can think about that. And that, in essence, is all of chapter 7. So for a quick closing summary, all the things that I can remember from chapter 7, uh, summarize all the equations that we should know, we have a delta theta. Delta theta is like a displacement. It's an angular displacement. We have omega. We have alpha. We have three kinematic equations. Omega F is equal to omega I plus alpha times delta T. We have change in theta is equal to omega initial times uh, delta T plus one half alpha times change in T squared. We have omega final squared is equal to omega initial squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. We have these units that we use. We have units called radians, and we know 2 pi radians are equal to 360 degrees, and it involves going around in a circle, in a circle so that uh, theta is equal to s divided by r, where r is the radius and s, we'll trace out s, s is some length along this outer part of our circle, and r are my radii, and theta is that angle right there. We also have a centripetal acceleration. An acceleration for when you're moving in a circle, centripetal acceleration is equal to, if I remember right, is v squared over r, or if we're using angular quantities, it could be omega squared times r. And since we have objects moving in circles, if an object has mass and it has an acceleration, it has a force. The nature of that force, the way we describe that force is a centripetal force. Centripetal force is equal to m times ac, which is m times v squared over r. Uh, and this should be more or less a pretty reasonable summary of everything you need to know from Chapter 7.